Okay, so uh, we're, we're kicking off the, the first in the Equilibrium and Spark Labs uh, co-hosted series. And we're looking and talking at um, top entrepreneurs around the world, but um, particularly focused on sustainability, food, agriculture, energy, and climate change. All the key themes that we're focused here at, um, at Equilibrium and also at Spark Labs Cultivate. So uh, your co-hosts are myself, and down there is Jay McCarthy. So we're the co-founders of uh, Spark Labs Group, of which Spark Labs Cultivate is part, which is our agricultural and uh, food tech and sustainability fund down in Australia. And we're also the co-founders uh, of Equilibrium World, which is building uh, your sustainability data platform. So an operational data platform to help with analytics, benchmarking, reporting, and scenario planning for um, sustainability for big companies. And uh, we're joined by the illustrious James and Tyler, uh, and uh, of James Tyler. Uh, and uh, they are part of our Spark Labs Cultivate Fund and uh, one of our most uh, exciting and promising companies. And we're gonna be talking about China, food, food chain, and, uh, and everything to do with um, the future in this uh, post-pandemic uh, way, because China is already back on its feet and, uh, and moving pretty fast. So um, I thought we'd kick off first with uh, one of you guys telling us a little bit, uh, telling everybody obviously about James Tyler. So, um, James, do you want to do that? Tyler, do you want to kick it off? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'm not calling from China. I'm in, um, in Australia at the moment, in Sydney, and Tyler's calling from Zhengzhou. Um, but, yeah, like you said, well, I've got a few flies flying around me, so if you see me swatting, it's, um, it's a couple, bit of a fly infestation at the moment. Anyway, um, the background of my personal background, I think it's worthwhile worth discussing, is I learned... Uh, um, Chinese Mandarin. So I was, I had studied for three years and, and ma majored in Mandarin. Thinking I was pretty good, I went to China and I jumped in a taxi in Beijing and I said, use my best Chinese at the time. Well, yeah, to Zhongguo and Sun. And the, and the taxi driver just looked at me and he's like, I have no idea what you just said. So that was a bit of a sobering moment after, you know, three years of studying really hard, thinking I was pretty good. I was in like grade six or something in a university. But anyway, I went and stayed in a um, family family uh, homestay. I lived there for a year and that's when my Chinese started to take off. Um, I was only going to be there for three months but ended up just loving it. And uh, I was there at a very interesting time and, and so was, was Tyler's obviously Chinese. Is at the early days of the wine boom, of the inter international wine boom, when the whole world's focus descended on China because China's thirst for wine started taking off. And it was a really interesting time there was lots of people, um, lots of money made, and lots, you know, millionaires. But at the same time, as we always say, for every winner, there was 99 losers because it was a time of, you know, just cowboys and fake labels and rip-offs. I think at the time there was a, um, a stat that for every Penfolds Grange bottle of wine, Penfolds Grange is a famous Australian bottle of wine, um, there was, it was being reused sort of uh, 45 times. So those sort of things, just cowboys everywhere. And Tyler was also selling um, premium Australian wine at the same time. He was actually selling Penfolds. And I think for both of us, we crossed paths a few times in the industry. And for both of us, that really established um, the need for, you know, what we're going to do for this fresh food boom. Because we weren't the first people to recognise that China was entering a imported fresh food boom and, and you know, upping the, the quality of, of fresh food. I think we're one of the only sort of foreign companies tackling it from a different approach. And that was the approach of transparency and control and supply chain. So actually the first thing we did was create an end-to-end -end cold chain logistics supply chain that uh, covers over 90% of the Chinese population. So if you sit back and you think about the entire supply chain, you know, starting from an Australian farm all the way to a Chinese consumer in the middle of China, where sort of 99% of the problems take place is at the border and the customs clearance process. Um, because, you know, 
if you're sitting, if your product's sitting on the tarmac in the middle of summer, it can be 60 degrees on that, on the hot tarmac or in the middle of winter, it could be minus 20 degrees. So every sort of hour, every half an hour, every minute counts. So we actually took the, um, the customs clearance process in-house. And um, so from, from end to end, we actually have an in-house customs clearance process um, and we distribute, we have warehouses all over China. And like I said before, we cover about 90% of China's population. What it's enabled us to do is to tap into some new trends that's going on in China. Because um, as you know, in, in China and particular a lot of Asian um, uh, cultures and, and countries is they're very trendy. And, and you know, following where the new platform is. So, I mean, young millennials in, in Western countries are the same, but um, particularly in China. So it might be the same consumer buying the exact same product, but they're on, you know, Weibo or, you know, Douyin one day, TikTok, um, you know, JD one day, you know, Taobao, Tmall, a whole bunch of platforms. But so what we can do with our supply chain is plug into those platforms and follow where the trends are and where the consumers are. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of basic, um, the quick spiel about James Tyler. I think in terms of sales channels, we sell, you know, through e-commerce channels, food service, um, social commerce, which, um, is basically people selling through social media. Cool. And, um, so, so going to now, so you are getting, um, what, how many products and what type of products, just in summary, are you getting into the, to the market and where do they come from? Okay, so you're talking about, um, you know, BC before Corona or, you know, AC after Corona? Because why, don't we do but, why don't we do yeah. both? Because I think that's exactly, you know, that's the interesting thing here. Like, I mean, and <laughs> BC and AC, um, uh, yeah, great terms. Go for it. Tell us both. Yeah. So yeah, BC before Corona, um, it was really, yeah, we specialize in short shelf life perishables, um, and consumer ready products. So as soon as anything goes into the commodity space, like a whole container load of, of frozen meat, that's not really our game. Whilst we can do it, that's just a commodity game. That's just tiny margins. Um, so anything that's consumer ready, uh, particularly in short shelf life perishables. So lots of dairy products, you know, milk, yogurt, ice cream, um, cheese, all those um, dairy, uh, you know, dairy cooking um, items such as you know cream cheese, mascarpone, um, sour cream, butter, those sort of things. Then there's meat, um, seafood, and fruit. So fruit's a really interesting one. I think um, there's enormous opportunity for fruit. Um, and yeah, so that's that's um, that's kind of BC. Then uh, AC, after Corona hit, is we've had to prioritise. So um, we've got our own brand of milk. So that's taken priority over everything. And um, we've gone through an interesting sort of, really interesting last couple of months, as you can imagine. At first, there was a, uh, the demand side problem. So Australian, New Zealand products going into China. But China was locked down. Um, all the Chinese people just you know, they stopped on, um, you know, discretionary spending and they just sort of bought, you know, rice and oil and the really core staples. And, um, and as well, during that time in China, our truck driver had to get from sort of Hernan province in the center of China through to Shanghai, passing, you know, a couple of different provinces, had to show sort of 11 or 12 different pieces of paper just to get through the border. So it was a real um, challenge. I think the good thing for us was it was so challenging that, um, because we have our own supply chain, we can actually manage that. Whereas a lot of foreign companies at that stage went, it's too hard, we're pulling out of China. So what's actually happened is there's a, a void of quality foreign products in China at the moment because everyone's just like, let's just focus on our domestic markets. We're not exporting to China anymore, it's too hard. So there's, you look, you, you go on e-commerce sites, you go on to retail stores, it's just sold out, sold out, sold out, sold out. Or in fact, it's actually not sold out. It's just not making it there at all. Um, so anyway, so this long answer to your question is we've really prioritised our milks. So we're setting up a lot of milk um, because now the, 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 the challenge is not importing in China because China's in, like, opened up. It's actually exporting out of Australia and New Zealand because um, there's just not that much air freight capacity anymore. So, and how do you solve that? How are you, but you, you are you gradually that's, is that opening up? Is that getting better or is it still, still tough? 
there's um, so yeah, we had solved that it. it was the passenger flight. So most cargo actually gets um, transported in the belly of passenger planes. So passenger planes were the first things to go. Um, passenger flights into China. So we, uh, step one, we flew passenger planes to Hong Kong and then on a cargo plane from Hong Kong into China because cargo planes were still allowed in. Then uh, the passenger planes started um, dramatically declining. I'll actually show you, I'll, show, I'll share the screen with you and show you this fantastic um, graph. So um, can you see that? So if you look at this, so on Certainly the left, can. aviation capacity, China, Australia, January 2020. So look at the amount of flights that are flying between Australia and China. And then underneath that is February 2020. So this is passenger um, flights. I think there was about, you know, five or six flights. So yeah, that was phase one. And then on the, on the right here, you can see, um, you know, how many, you know, we've got 185, 186 flights per week down to, you know, an absolutely tiny amount. Um, it actually dropped to 12 and then it went to 20 and then it went up to about 30. We we're tracking it and we were like, okay, we're bouncing back. And then the rest Western world <laughs> collapsed. So um, that just kind of stopped. So I haven't actually looked at that recently because we haven't really needed to. It's just been pretty tough. Um, so now really there's no chance was very little chance in getting in passenger cargo planes. It's all uh, passenger flights. It's all about getting into cargo. Getting um, into cargo. But you guys now have the chain, right? Which is so interesting. So while everyone else pulled out, I mean, Australia's prime position now. If you guys, once the cargo flights start, you guys have still been on the ground. You haven't pulled out. Um, and now... You know, let's talk about the let's talk about the consumer. So, I mean, let's uh, switch over to Tyler for a second. Um, let, we'll pop off that uh, screen share for a second. Yep. And um, yep. Tyler, let's um, yes. let's switch over to you there, right in the middle of uh, right in the middle of China there. So, um, yep. tell us more. Tell us about tell us a bit about yourself actually, and um, uh, how you how you got started on this, and you know, just just the developments in China now. A, well, let's uh, and we'll keep AC as well. Like um, I think uh, as uh, as much as we can, because you guys are in a very interesting position. Yeah. So basically, I I fly back to China. I think it was on the sixth of January. I think just right of the before Chinese coronavirus um, boomed, and I was allowed to travel. So I, I fly from Sydney to Beijing, actually to meet and and meet. A customer in Beijing so at that that time they're basically the people are already starting to talking about coronavirus but I think the government haven't taken any something serious any haven't taken any significant um, action yet but um, one of my friends in Beijing have given given me a mask when I try to travel from Beijing to Zhengzhou at that time on the on the high-speed train and even the government haven't done anything yet. I see everyone wearing masks when, when we travel. I, I think that's the that's a huge contrast um, between what happened in Australia, what we see happening in Australia, what happened in Italy, or other other Western countries, where people don't have a habit of wearing masks. <laughs> and yeah, that that I think lots of. All the Chinese would be surprising and also questioning why doesn't Australian or Americans or Europeans wearing a mask? <laughs> Tell us now, so Tyler, so how, I mean, the, the country's obviously getting back on its feet really quickly. You know, so how are things, how are things going? How do they, how are they managing things? Um, I, I think there are a couple of factors. Um, number one, wearing masks, that's very important. And, and China doing, doing really well on it. The government actually made it, made it compulsory even now. So I, 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 got, I got my mask here. If I'm going out, I, I need to mask up <laughs> like, like that. Yep. And yeah, so that's number one. I think number two is the China, China is very digitalized, fully digitalized now. So everything, everything you have basically is, is here. So, and the government actually using the tool of mobility, the, the phone, 
to managing the coronavirus. And maybe I, I think I can sharing a couple of maybe screenshots to you guys on, on my Yeah, that'd phone. be so interesting. Yeah, do that. Yes, to see some of the tool where we where the Chinese government using. Um, I see I can Oh no, and James is James is screen sharing it, so you can just do those actually. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. He he got he got the thing here already. Yeah. And um, you, you can see there's a couple of um, pictures here. And um, when you go to when, when when I try to enter my office now, so you get firstly you're getting a, a temperature checks. So if the reading is right and then you, you follow up scanning that QR code or like using your phone. So you so scan once you scan, you scan in. Yeah, you scan in. Once you scan your QR code, basically you log it in. The phone, uh, the phone linked it with whether it's Alipay or WeChat, where that thing were basically collecting your geolocation all the time. So everyone in China been giving a, a, a code. If you are healthy, you never get in touch with anyone who been quarantined. And you have a green code. And if you've been actually like anyone who been tested temperature and abnormal and sent it to hospital and tested, uh, been tested positive, and then everyone can trace back using their phone, basically government can trace back using, using the phone where you have been, who are, who are the people become like a, a close, a close to you. And then when you scanning that code again, your code will become yellow. So once you become yellow, you will probably be taken away to a hospital to do a test. Got it. If you've been tested positive, and then you will have a red code. And anyone who have a close contact with the yellow code or with the red code, your code will temporarily become red as well. If you're scanning the code and become red, you will be taken away straight away. I mean, it's very so efficient. I, Yes, yeah, it's very, very efficient. Straight away, the government can quarantine everyone who are basically who have the risk and or who are already being tested positive. It's very clever. So, I mean, uh, very clever. Yeah, we, we've, been, we've been doing that. We've been enforcing that, I think, for about eight weeks. And it's really strict. Everywhere you go, you need to do it. So. If you found that you have a, you are risky, you are yellow code, and you need to go to hospital. You basically being forced to go to hospital straight away. And, and we've been doing that for eight weeks, and then the number have showing and going down very dramatically. Yep. And what's the second? What's the second picture there, um, guys? So the second the, the second picture is I I taking it. So I I did a business trip yesterday uh, last uh, last yep. week. So I visited one of our customer uh, supermarket ch customer China Resource, which they based in Shenzhen, and I need to taking a flight from Zhengzhou flying there. Yep. So when I when I bought aircraft, you see, and um, there there's another QR code I need to scan, where that created by the Shenzhen city, Shenzhen city government, and to collect all my information where I come from, where I have been. And then that's stored in the mega database in, in Shenzhen government. Later on, when I check, check in the hotel, they have that information already. That's great. Uh, so, they, so they know you. Oh, sorry, Jay, yeah. Yeah, on that note, I was just going to interject and, and ask this, Tyler. The whole world yes. is talking about, of course, the current impact of their businesses, and then what happens when business gets turned back on and we're able to resume uh, our activities. but. Given your comments, I just want to ask, do you already determine that there are changes that will take place to James Tyler operations permanently? Is, is it a matter of going back to business as was normal, or is it really now there are permanent changes which need to be addressed? Um, I think I, I think there are probably some permanent changes, but given the time, so it only like a, I, I would say uh, in China, uh, really about eight weeks. That's people live in a really different environment. Like they need to stay at home. They need to do this at home and when they go out. And I, I'm personally probably thinking that's not enough, not long enough actually to permanent change, change people's behavior. But 
but what's actually would change people's behavior is the fear actually happened during the coronavirus. When people are experiencing fears, people fear to actually to call the virus and then they fear to be dead. That fear actually could probably given some uh, permanent changes to people's behavior. And, and even if the people don't permanently change their behavior, I think the government may, right? We already yeah, see that. Yeah, that's right. That, that, yeah, exactly. You, you, make the, you, you make the point. Yeah, well, I think um, the key thing to remember is, the, um, is it originated in a Wuhan wet market. So, um, so there's, they've already cracked down on, on the wet markets. I think about 80% of China's food is bought and sold in wet markets. It's an amazing, amazing stat. Um, so suddenly the consumer is very sensitive to what you know, products they're consuming and, and how they're buying it and where they're buying it from. And then also the government um, is also very sensitive to supply chains. There's actually a really great um, little movie which went viral on TikTok Tyler sent it to me a couple of uh, weeks ago. It, it, can you show movies on, on here? Yeah, 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 you, you can. Yeah, okay. It's only sort of 30 seconds long. Um, yeah, it works. Be, be ready. Should I show it now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's really good. Um, I'll show it. it. It flies, so be ready. It goes very quickly because it's all on TikTok. Bianduha 有一条新的关于食品的生产、运输、加工、销售等这样的一个产业链会孕育而生。这将又是一个巨大的蓝海市场，类似像钱大妈、河马先生、京东到家等这样的生鲜企业将迎来爆发式的增长。所有相关从事
we've come through this and now we've got an opportunity to to really change things right so everything from the food chain supply chain i guess we're going to see more autonomous vehicles as well right we're going to see um you know less disruption to the supply chain through autonomous vehicles as well exactly i think you, you're going to see more an automated vehicle and also you're going to see a, a lot more electric vehicle in china as well and what type of what type of um what type of produce are you guys going to focus on now you've got obviously you're focusing on milk um but what's the next step as the if the car, once the cargo flights start getting back what's the next uh what's the next stuff that you're going to focus on bringing into the market And um, so basically, I think what we're going to focusing on, we're going to keep focusing on perishables. So short, short life, anything fresh, that's what we're going to focusing on. But our key focus for the next, I think, three months, I think still would be dairy, fresh dairy. Especially during the after the coronavirus, I think for Chinese, the immunization become a hot topic. So right. and I got, I, yeah, I got another video. I think I, I want to probably show yeah, you guys. Definitely show us. And put it on. Well, um, while Tyler's, Tyler's doing that, I'll tell you an interesting story about beef and, and meat. Obviously last year was a crazy year. There was the, um, the swine flu, flu, wiped out pork, obviously. Um, that was huge in China. So there was a big protein shortage. But what happened with Australia is really interesting is we have a, Australia had a quota. Um, and so there's a certain tax breaks when the meat import, which is mainly beef, is below that quota. But because of the swine flu, we hit, Australia hit that export quota with, by August. So what happened is there was hardly any export between sort of, you know, September and December. And then suddenly on like December 12, around about, you know, early December, all these cargo, all these ships started shipping up meat, Australian meat. So by January 1, there was, there was boats and boats and boats of Australian meat waiting at the ports ready to be cleared. So it was a huge backlog. And then obviously coronavirus hits three weeks later. So it's just this huge backlog. There's meat law in China at the moment. Um, so we're not touching, touching meat for a little bit. Um, we'll leave that to other people. Certainly it's dairy at the moment. Um, fresh fruit and seafood is the key. So James, with that, and, and Tyler can answer this as well, with this array of products that you're successfully bringing in with this virus potentially accelerating that, uh, with consumers looking for integrity of food source and quality, you know, all sits well for you guys. But even that probably isn't enough, right? Just being from Australia and having theoretically trusted food sources. How are you guys going further and making sure James Tyler develops real brand recognition an acknowledgement from the people is the high quality food source that they want. What are you doing? And is there evidence, clear evidence to you guys that your brand status is improving in China? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So um, I think I, just to answer that question, I think it's good worthwhile having a bit of background knowledge because um, there's a lot of um, miscommunication or misunderstanding in the China market. First of all is everyone's like, oh, Chinese people are becoming Western. They just want um, our Western products. And I, I always find that a really interesting um, thing to say because I can eat as much sushi and uh, Peking duck as I like, and no one is ever going to say he's becoming more Eastern. So, um, yeah, whereas Chinese people, they eat a steak and have coffee, and everyone's like, oh, he's becoming Western. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so the answer to that is that Chinese people are becoming modern. And I think that's where, uh, you know, a lot of foreign companies totally, totally um, stuffed up their marketing and their positioning and their value proposition to Chinese people. The other one is um, clean and green. So everyone's like, oh, the old clean and green story. You can sell, let's just like take some pictures of some cows on a nice, you know, green grass and put a fancy logo on, sell it for 30 or 40% more because Australia is so clean and green, everyone wants that. And that's just a load of rubbish. Um, frankly, as far as a Chinese person's concerned, everywhere in the world that isn't China is clean and green. And actually some places in China are fantastically clean and green, like Xinjiang, um, uh, Inner Mongolia, and everybody is doing the exact same thing. So the, the whole world 
basically saying let's target a uh, and consumer with a clean brand. And that's just, uh, there's just no cut through with that. Um, so Jay, just sort of, I think that's worthwhile having that sort of background. So sort of answer your question where, um, how you can kind of get cut through is, that's just your fundamental baseline level. Um, yep, you're from Australia, okay, you're, you're clean and green, um, you're good product. Now you've got to build upon on that. And what we found is, um, you know, everyone talks about QR codes and digital stories and, you know, picture of the farmer. And we actually found that, you know, um, scanning of QR codes is actually really small as well. Like, particularly for a bottle like milk, you scan it once and then everyone's like, okay, great. Um, I know where that milk comes from. I'm never scanning it again. So what's the point? Um, yeah, sure, you've, 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 you've met that first barrier, which is, you know, I, I want to have trust in this brand. So that's the first thing. But then you've got to think of ways to engage the consumer. And there's so many other ways like loyalty programs, gamification, to get people, consumers engaged and, and, and going out. So I think firstly is a, a bit more understanding and a little bit less, I, like, I think it's arrogance from the, the Western world, um, not really jumping in the shoes of the Chinese consumer. Um, so I think that's really, yeah, really important to understand a couple of those. Things. I agree with you. And you could say the Chinese are modernizing their case, or you could just say they're diversifying, just giving themselves more options which is then more incumbent upon you guys to actually create brand status in China. So I'm with you on that. And, and I want to just go back to the government too, to ask this question. You know, there's no doubt current circumstance is helping you guys. You're well positioned, you're clean and green, you're providing uh, legit food product to Chinese at a time of uh, heightened need. So all that's great and understood. But we were talking to Tyler before about what's the future look like. And just to go back to that for a moment, you know, whereas the Chinese government wants options and wants quality and all that kind of stuff, they also naturally have a disposition of self-sustainability. And that kind of works against you guys in the long haul, unless perhaps you create ways to kind of build yourselves into the infrastructure, which could be expensive, or to have more of a local presence on the ground. And I think I even saw somewhere in the news that you guys were talking about, even at one point, perhaps creating cold facilities at the bottom of buildings so that people can get your product delivered. Do you guys need to become more local or build yourselves in with an infrastructure effort in order to be to kind of avoid that that wall that gets created by China's need for self sustainability? Yeah, that's a really good, really good question. Um, so the answer is yes, we do, and um, that's what we're actually doing right now. So I think the focus is to differentiate ourselves, sort of in phase one, phase two of our growth has really been on foreign Australian farm to Chinese table. Um, but now um, where the sort of, where the really interesting um, growth that's happening in China at the moment is a thing called um, community buying groups. So um, this kind of happened about, you know, sometime last year. And what it is, everyone in, in China uh, lives in, you know, apartment complexes. So there might be a thousand or 2000 people living in a big community, um, you know, um, apartment complex what's happening is they're appointing a group leader and that group leader could be the strata manager just a local resident or the local convenience store owner and that group leader is consolidating orders on behalf of all those residents and going to companies like us and saying hey can we have you know a ton of milk so that's completely disrupting the whole um, fresh food supply chain in China um, you save costs because Last mile delivery costs are, are basically non-existent. You're delivering one ton in bulk. And the big barrier to e-commerce fresh food platforms um, has always been last mile delivery costs, which are often um, more expensive than the actual product itself. You know, our bottle of milk might cost 25 renminbi, but to deliver it, that last mile is another 20 renminbi. So, it's, so it doesn't make as much sense. Um, so... What we are actually doing is, um, Tyler actually just went out to Xinjiang province. Xinjiang is like the Tasmania of China. I mentioned it before, it's way out west. Um, they've got you know, amazing fresh produce. Australia just recognized it as a bio secure um, food production region. So any food coming from Xinjiang into Australia, you know, going the other way, um, doesn't have to go through fumigation or heat treatment or cold treatment for things like, um, you know, food, you know, any pests. So Tyler just went out on a, um, on a sourcing trip 
recently. I actually got photo. I was actually going to show you photos of the um, of his trip for coronavirus regions, but um, might just share it anyway. Oh yeah, um, definitely. Tyler, going to have this is your trip. This is him. This is Tyler on the plane on a government delegation trip to totally. Xinjiang. Tyler, take us through it. Um, yeah, so it's quite an interesting trip. So I, I, I went to Xinjiang basically on the government charter where, uh, where um, government tried to bring workers from uh, mainland and back to Xinjiang to work, back to work. It's a back to work flight. So it's uh, full of uh, uh, workers there. And when we landed, and th there was a government official, I think the mayor was in the, on, on the time at, was trying to welcome everyone back to work. And then, and Jeff, uh, can you, uh, uh, you put the next slide? Yeah, and then we've been, we've been, we've been. Can you say that? Yeah, we can. Yep. Yeah, we've been, we've been transported into a quarantine truck, a quarantine bus, and you see everyone wearing masks. And then we've been taken to a hospital, a local hospital, to do, and we did, we did the blood test. Where the can, can you change the next slide, Jens? Yeah, we we we've been we've been we did the um, blood test, and also we did the CT screaming. So after we all clear test negative, and then we are allowed to go back to work. It's quite strict. <laughs> That's pretty intense. That's very yeah. very good. I mean, yeah. my God, when you just realise how far the rest of the world is behind this, it's incredible. I mean, Jay, he's just, and James, when you, when you look at this and you go, my God, like, you know, I don't know if we, if, I, I can't imagine the UK or US managing to get to this level of efficiency very soon. Um, but uh, it's pretty necessary. That's, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, so basically the, the, the trip, basically the trip for, um, that, that's the picture for us to getting back to the office now. And you need basically, there's a guy downstairs scanning and did the temperature check. And then you need to scan the QR code again. That QR code give you a green. When they're showing green, you're allowed to go basically. And it, this is interesting because there's just signs everywhere. So they've allocated- yeah, There's propaganda everywhere. <laughs> yeah. We just don't, I don't, there's no signs in Sydney, nothing. The yard ad. And then um, I found this interesting. This is how you, you get up in the elevator with toothpicks. Yeah. <laughs> toothpicks, that's, isn't that fascinating? And plastic over. I mean, it's just, it's just a level of organisation that, oh, my God. I, it's just, uh, I don't know. Jay, how long do you reckon it's going to take the US to get to this sort of level of organisation? Uh, it's, it's almost too late, isn't it, for them to avoid the real pain that they're going to incur in their system now. So everything is catch up from here, and it's not going to be sufficient. But, uh, you know, they've, they've shown that it takes a long time to rally resources and, and be sufficient for a population of 300 million. So It's pretty interesting. Time. Hey, um, I just want to pick up on yeah, the on thread. I, I know the Chinese government has had a big focus these last few years on developing the Western region, and I'm sure it's going to be successful over time. But when it comes to agriculture, of course, it's deficient in, sufficient in water supply. It's a dry yes. region. I'm sure they're trying to do things to change that. But isn't that a huge challenge for you guys? Or does that also mean that you start to look at warehouse production of food, hydroponics, and this kind of thing? How are you going to manage being productive in Xinjiang? Um, you, what, what are you talking about? Two different things. So managing the cultivating, cultivate, what you're talking about is how we, how Chinese people cultivating in Xinjiang, I think, rather than how we, how we managing the supply chain from Xinjiang to end consumers. And so cultivating in Xinjiang, Xinjiang, and Xinjiang is a huge area in China. I think Xinjiang have a 40, about 35% of land, Xinjiang province, that's, that's, that's China, like, um, so, not everywhere in Xinjiang doesn't have water. There are about 35% of area in Xinjiang where there's not enough water, this whole desert. But also there's a like 10, 20% of area where it looks really green. It's full of grasslands. Like you, you actually, people actually do um, pasture and glazing cattle and sheep there, some of the Xinjiang area. 
and some with Xinjiang area are probably half half, where you need you, you, you naturally you don't have a water there. But China has a pretty good irrigation system, where government spend a lot of money on getting the glacier water um, from the snow mountain and get it in the farmland. So I think where that project is um, is a is in the right post is a simultaneously uh, with the migrants project. Xinjiang also is a big migrant um, province where Chinese government tried to bring mainland, mainland Chinese into that region. And they, they do it together, building the new canal, bringing water from the snow mountain, from the glacier water, and also um, bringing in peoples. The population grows and the water grows, it's just doing um, in the same way. So cultivating, I think it's growing. Xinjiang, the cultivation of agriculture in Xinjiang is very similar to US. The government doesn't encourage any small farmers. The all big farmers, huge farmers. Like farmers growing like, uh, on like 10,000 acres of uh, cottons. Or farmers growing like, uh, on like 200 acres of uh, apple orchard. It's all big operations. So, um, thanks. so Jay, thanks, Jay um, interestingly, so where we started was actually in Hernan province, which is uh, right there. And that's where we, um, we had our first, you know, customs clearance license and uh, in a city called Zhengzhou. So um, Hernan province is historically really important to the whole of China. Um, two of the seven ancient capitals of China were in um, Hernan province, Luoyang and Kaifeng. The Kaifeng is actually where Tyler is from. And just like, I don't know if you know, Sydney and Melbourne uh, had a bit of a battle on where are we going to put the capital city and we put it uh, in Canberra. Uh, Zhengzhou was the exact same thing. So you had right between Luoyang and Kaifeng was Zhengzhou. And that's a massive new city where uh, it's the, the Chinese government actually in, in 2013, you know, they've been, their plan has been to move commerce away from the coast, move it inland into the central plains. In 2013, they actually pointed Wuhan, where the coronavirus outbreak, you're gonna become the car manufacturing hub of China. Here's a couple of billion dollars, make it happen. And they, they went and did that. And for Zhengzhou, they said, you're gonna become the aerotropolis of China. A um, couple of billion dollars, go make that happen. So what Zhengzhou have done is create this huge city based around a, um, an enormous airport. So focusing on short shelf life, perishables and time sensitive products. So I don't know if you've heard of the company Foxconn that produced sort of 60% of the world's iPhones uh, or maybe all the world's iPhones, but you know, something like, I think 60 or 70% of the world's smartphones are produced in Hernan province. Um, and so using this airport, when iPhone release their new version, you know, there's like 100, 200 747s flying out of Zhengzhou every day for a couple of weeks to fill demand. But um, what's happened, the really interesting thing is Beijing's, you know, straight up, straight up above. Guangzhou is, is right down. So it's on the, um, it's on a traffic junction between north and south China and then east to west um, on the Silk Road right out to um, Hamburg in Germany. So that's the old Silk Road. So what's happened, they've actually built part of the, um, oh, I can't remember what, it, think of what it's called. What's it called? The oh, Belt and Road, um, China Belt and Road Project is um, they've got the train that goes straight from Zhengzhou all the way to Hamburg in Germany. And you can, hire, you can buy a BMW and it'll, be and it'll be delivered from Germany to your door in, in Zhengzhou sort of in nine or 10 days. So um, Xinjiang, where Tyler was talking about, passes straight through that, um, through that railway. So that's one of the big projects that we want to look, look at opening up is because train and rail freight is uh, dirt cheap, really safe. It's on time. You just get a container of whatever product you want, chilled, put it on the back of a train. You know, they just add another you know, container, another, um, yeah, another container on the back, it's easy. So first we want to sort of connect with um, Xinjiang and then we want to connect with other countries along that, on, along that uh, train rail. Well, that's fascinating, guys, and thanks for the update. That's certainly news to me. It's a few years since I've been in Urumqi, and that was really uh, for mining matters, and that had us out in Kyrgyzstan and 
Mongolia and that kind of Stan region around that province. And water shortage was always talked about from a mining industry perspective, but it sounds like China's advanced the situation greatly. So fascinating. Yeah, because I think one of the Chinese advantage on the water is like uh, where it doesn't have a capitalized water system. It's like um, you, yeah. you water you're treating water as an asset where the government controlled it. So government can actually deploy whatever they want and, and actually and doesn't matter. They, they, if they try to do that strategically, they can ignore the, the economic in, uh, factor of the, of the water. They don't have to, to divert into the most, um, um, most economical outcome like mining or they can probably diverting into cotton production or food production in Xinjiang rather than um, and send it to um, digging the coal mine. All right, so we're back. And um, all right, so we'll, we're gonna start wrap, wrapping this up. This has been fascinating. I, I could literally talk about this for absolutely hours um, with you guys and your insights on the ground. In fact, I think, I think we're gonna need a couple more follow-up uh, follow videos just because I wanna delve so much more into this. But- um, Next week, so, same time, Frank? Oh, next week, same time. I think it's just going to turn into the James Tyler show because uh, it's it's just more fascinating than anything else. So, um, uh, so with you guys um, now, so J I guess the next the focus now, James is is figuring out how to get more cargo, right? So, now how do you just as a quick one, how do you even solve that problem? I mean, you guys have a big pool, so how do you how do you get that those cargo slots? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. What, what actually happened, the Australian government, um, well, actually, I don't know if you read anything in the news about um, lobsters. You know, the Australian lobster industry, I think 95 to 98% of the lobsters get exported to China. Um, Chinese New Year's a big time for celebrations. And, um, and suddenly there's, you know, Chinese New Year disappears, there's no more weddings. Uh, there's no reason to eat lobsters. People don't really eat lobsters at home. So the uh, um, Brolos, who are Australia's biggest exporter of, of lobsters, they started lobbying the government saying, if you don't get some flights going to China, we're under. And it's a huge multi-million dollar company, huge industry, employs a lot of people. So uh, the Australian government actually just announced um, what they're calling Lobster Air. Uh, I'll share the screen. Um, here it is here. Yeah, Lobster Air. So I think they've put, um, I think $150 million to support um, short shelf life perishable food items to China. So that's uh, seafood, dairy, chilled meat and fresh fruit. So, um, so that's really good news for us. That only just announced about a week ago and um, yeah, we've been speaking with them a bit. Um, so we'll find out what happens. Yeah, for next week's episode, we'll probably have an update. Fantastic. Okay. Well, um, mate, that's uh, that's uh, very interesting. And so, and then Tyler, what do you? Uh, what's your kind of role now on the ground? So, do you just looking at more distribution channels? Do you start? Um, you know, what, what's the what's the next steps over the next few weeks? So my, my role in China right now is we're going to look into more distribution channel, like you said. And also another thing strategically important is for us to um, getting more engagement with end consumer. So we're actually planning to do a TikTok and direct to consumer and project. So that's what I'm, I'm looking into it right now in China. I'm, I'm going to be fascinated by that TikTok. So just milk, milk from Australia to, to China, the TikTok um, uh, is, uh, that's, that's going to be pretty cool. Okay. Um, well, listen, guys, thanks very much for this. It's been um, absolutely fascinating. I mean, obviously, things change dramatically now, right? So supply chain, food, sustainability, climate, health, security, everything changes. Uh, and you guys are really well positioned to take advantage of that. It's um, that's really cool. Yeah, Very so good. I think before we go, I'd better give a quick shout out to Ripe.io, who are part of our cohort. And yep. um, we're currently developing our blockchain project at the moment. So we should have, in two weeks or three weeks, we'll finish our first blockchain um, following milk 
right from when it's pro processed in Australia through to the Chinese consumer. So that's pretty exciting. And that answers one of your questions. I didn't get around to it before, Jay, but um, what you're sort of focusing on, what changes, I think um, blockchain and um, more digital supply chain is going to be really important in the future. So connecting the real world with the virtual world is uh, one of our projects at the moment. Absolutely. Interesting. Yep. And Ripe.io have been another Spark Labs Cultivate company. So um, always keeping it in the, in the, in the, um, in the family. So, well, uh, best of luck, guys. So, I mean, we are both obviously at Spark Labs Cultivate as we, as we um, move into more and more uh, across food and sustainability. And then at Equilibrium, as we work to provide data solutions for companies um, that can help them look at sustainability and, and monitor and understand assets right across their supply chain and how they can become more sustainable uh, is, is fascinating. It sounds like um, we're all in the sweet spot for this. So um, thanks, Tyler. Um, best, best luck up there. And um, thanks, James. Great. I think you got that fly in the end because it sort of disappeared after a while. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, so that's it. It's a wrap from myself and, uh, and Jay. And uh, thanks again, guys. Much appreciated. Thanks, guys. We will have a follow on. Absolutely. Great. All right. All the best. Thanks, yeah. Jay. See you guys. Cheers, mate.